To have great upwind performance comes down to a couple of things. Be faster through the water than your competitors. Sail a shorter distance from A to B than your competitors. But is it really as simple as that? Hi, my name's Andy Rice, and today I'm enlisting the help of professional sailor Nathan Outridge to help you get upwind faster than you've ever been before. Now, um, Nathan, thanks for joining us today. How's life and um, how are you going upwind these days? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, life's good. I just got uh, back to New Zealand after being out of the country for about eight months. Um, and yeah, just uh, nice to have a chat to you today about going sailing upwind as fast as we can. There's obviously lots of different ways you can do that. And I'm sure we'll get into the details for our chat tonight. Yeah, well, no one knows more different ways of getting upwind faster than you do. So let's just take a, a quick look at who Nathan Outridge is and what he's done in his career so far. So Nathan, whatever is going on at the top of the sport, you have probably been there or you're probably there right now. And uh, congratulations on being signed up as part of Emirates Team New Zealand. Not many Aussies get taken on by the uh, the Kiwis. So uh, so that, that's a bit of a feather in your cap as well. Um, just looking at that video then um, and all the different ways that we've got a, a, of getting a boat around a race course, um, what are the what are the common factors? I mean, I, at the top of the show, I, I put it down to two simple things in a formula. Go faster than the opposition and sail a shorter distance than the opposition. Is it as simple as that? Well, technically, I guess it is as simple as that. Like the faster that you're going, um, if you can go faster than your competitors, then you're going to be in front of them. But, you know, it's the balance to that equation, you know, is doing the least amount of distance. And I guess I look at it in a really simple way. It's try to sail the boat as fast as possible, get your boat going to the highest VMG speed that you can, but at the same time, use the wind and use your strategy to sail least distance. So that means, you know, picking gusts to go fast in and, and getting shifts right so that you can sail a lift attacker going up wind. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you a choice. Um, let's say you can't have the best of everything. You can't be the fastest and, and you, you, you're not necessarily the best at sailing the shortest distance. Would you rather be fast and stupid or smart and slow? I prefer to be smart and slow. Oh, OK. I was thinking I'd rather be fast and stupid. So so give me give me your reason why. Well, I... I've been in that scenario several times before where I haven't been the fastest boat in the fleet. And um, obviously you can do things to try and go faster, but I quite enjoy the, the ability to sniff out a wind shift that others can't see um, to, to get that advantage. Now, you know, if I was fast and stupid, you're just going really fast in the wrong direction often. And I think it's quite frustrating as a sailor if you're doing all your training and all your speed training before racing, and you're always winning those lineups, but as soon as you get on the race course, you start getting beaten by others. Um, I think that would be more frustrating than knowing you've got a bit of a speed deficit, but then being as clever as you can be with your boat positioning around the track, because you know there's positioning relative to the fleet, but then it's positioning relative to the wind and, and reading wind patterns. And you know, I quite like that side of the sport. And that scenario that you talk about, about someone being really fast in tune up and training before a regatta, um, 
how often have you been spooked by that when you've seen that and 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 then how often have you seen that and thought no when it comes to race day they're they're, they're not going to be there that that raw speed is is not going to see them around the racetrack it depends on who that individual is i guess it's like if if you know your competition well and you know that some people are just you know really good at making boats go fast but when it comes to getting off the start line they struggle or when you get to a venue where it's quite shifty they don't understand you know that the wind patterns as well that's when you i guess feel comfortable against those people but if you're going to a place like say let garda where it's just a race to the corner tack at the cliffs and then it's a race back to the top mark i don't think it matters how smart you are um, the faster boats are going to win in those scenarios so it depends on the venue and it depends on you know those individuals that you're up against but um you know i, I feel that the coolest thing about sailing for me is that you can you got to get from point a to point b and because we can't just go in a straight line because it's an upwind and downwind race you've got to balance this equation all the time of where are you going should you be going fast should you be going high um, what's the shift phase and people can go left right corner or up the middle and all arrive about the same time and i think that's that's the best thing about the sport. There's no one answer to, to win races. Yeah, okay. And and so you, you've put your cards more on um, sailing smart. That That's presumably because you feel a greater sense of achievement by outsmarting the opposition than outspeeding the opposition. But of course, you want to have a lot of all of it, don't you? You want to be, you want to be fast and you want to be smart. But let me throw a name at you that I know you'll know very well, Matt Belcher in the 470, greatest of all time in the 470. I think, I always get this wrong. I always underestimate, I think eight world championships, he, world titles he's won um, and uh, two gold medals and, and one silver medal at the Olympics. Um, now he's well known in the 470 for starting somewhere in the middle of the line and sticking pretty closely to the middle of the course. Um, now that's you know that's a typically conservative uh you know textbook tactical way of sailing um but he can only do that because he's got really good speed right exactly like you know that's the thing is the ultimate goal for for any sailor is to have a speed advantage over the competition because as soon as you have that speed advantage you can start a bit more conservatively you can you know instead of pushing an end at the start you can start in the middle of the line um, if you feel like it's a left-handed track, you don't have to be the furthest left boat to still be in the group at the top mark. And, you know, I think the longer the race goes, the more that the faster boats are going to win out. Um, it's the same, you know, in Olympic sailing, you know, if you're sailing a moth or you, you look at the America's Cup is the best example. The fastest boat is going to win so long as the guy's sailing it just pointed in the right direction and, and don't do silly things with it. Um, so... Of course, you'd always want to have the quickest boat, but I think I've done quite a lot of one design sailing over my time in the 49er is a classic example of a one design boat where sure you could get a speed advantage here or there by, you know, setting the equipment up correctly and being in the right settings, but ultimately it comes down to your, your tactical decision making and, you know, if we're talking about upwind performance today. Um, you know, the boats go so close in speed that it's more about where you're taking those boats and how you're minimising your distance and, and all of that um, kind of stuff that, you know, becomes more important in those one design classes. One thing that I think is always a bit of a risk when talking to top sailors like yourself is that you're used to having higher than average boat speed, whereas statistically most people on this call, um, half of them, might be faster than average but the other half are going to be slower than average and and tactically your um your options upwind and downwind for that matter but upwind in particular um when you when you have to start escaping other people's bad air because you can't hold your lane because you're not quite fast enough you, you you've got a much um smaller set of choices tactically so just just tell us about that whole boat speed may, makes you a tactical genius. Tell us both sides of the coin of that, being faster than average and being slower than average and how you would deal with that situation. 
Yeah, there's, there's kind of, I, I always believe there's three factors to being really good at sailing. The first thing is, is you have to have really good boat handling of your boat so that you know you can tack and jibe efficiently. Because if you can't tack and jibe efficiently or you're risking capsizing when it's windier, um, then you're going to be off the pace immediately. You know, capsize costs you a lot of time. So like when I look at, you know, getting into a new class and how can I be at the front of the fleet, it's get your boat handling sorted as a fundamental before you even consider racing. And then the next bit is be fast. So that's getting the right equipment to be competitive and then learning how to set up all the equipment. Because if you can't have at least equal speed with the top guys in the class, um, then it doesn't matter how good you are at racing. So, and then the third bit is, you know, race well and i've seen it so many times in olympic classes where people would do the european tour and they're still got boat handling problems so you know that those people aren't going to be your competition because they're going to throw away meters around the racetrack from poor tax and jibes and the odd cap size here or there and then there's the group of people who've got their boat handling sorted but they're not fast enough because either they you know, in some classes, the fitness isn't there, so they can't hike as hard to keep the boat going as quick. In other cases, like a 49er, for example, they haven't, you know, learned how to tune the rig properly. They haven't got their skills sorted to, to trim the boat in a way that makes it go fast. So that takes out probably another huge percentage of the fleet. And so then what you have left is a small group of boats at the front that have great boat handling, have good speed skills, that they're the ones you're racing against. And so the goal is to, to tick box one and two so that when you start racing, you're actually got your head out of the boat, able to make these tactical decisions. And, you know, unfortunately for there has been several times where I've raced in classes where I haven't had box one and two ticked and you end up picking up the scraps. You end up trying to get slithers of fresh air here and there, but ultimately your options are limited. It doesn't matter how smart you are. You're not going to outsmart people that have the fundamentals correct. And so, you know, when I said before, I prefer to be smarter rather than fast, you know, I'm not saying I'm going to be slow. I'm just saying, you know, if I have the same average speed as the top group, then I feel like that's when, you know, being clever around the racetrack, you know, gets the best result, best rewards. Yeah. So ticking box one and two, working on your boat handling, working on your boat speed um we see this even at olympic level you talked about this earlier um, when people are lacking in those departments what do they do they often go racing even more um is more racing the answer to solving uh, those uh, ticking those boxes one and two no i i personally i don't think so like i i made a pretty big jump from the 470 to the 49er um you know straight out of my youth sailing days and you know, the fundamental thing that, you know, Emmett, our coach said to us is that, you know, if you don't have your boat handling skills up to speed, do not waste money going to Europe because it'll be just frustrating, you know, trying to compete when you're losing meters every time you turn corners. So we worked really hard to get our basic boat handling to a level to then make it advanced boat handling so that we knew every tack and jibe and every different way you go around the top and bottom marks we could com we could do it competently you know we weren't ever going to be the best in the world at it in one year and then once we got our boat handling sorted and our confidence in the boat we then focused really hard on learning how to make the boat go fast through sailing skills so learning how to you know play the vang and the cunningham and learning you know trimming the the main and the jib effectively upwind and steering in the correct modes to keep the boat going fast and and through his knowledge and experience we learned a lot about how to set the rig up you know with all the different settings that you have on a 49er if you're out of range on your rig settings um, and the wind changes a couple of knots then you are going to be slow so it's a lot about understanding how to control the power of the rig and predicting what you're going to get for the the 25 30 minute race you're about to do and so we, we were focused purely on those two things before we went and did any racing in Europe. 
And I was kind of relying, and I was sailing with Ben Austin at the time, we were relying on our racing skills that we'd learned from youth classes. And Ben was a great laser sailor. And I'd come through, you know, 29ers, the 20s.